Fantastic. I hope everybody took a moment, got yourself a little water, had a little stretch, did what you need to do to get back in the room for our next session. I'm really excited for you guys to be able to meet Dr. Judy Shao, um, who's coming up next and will be talking about bariatric surgery and long-term management post-surgery and what that looks like. I know that that was uh, definitely a moment in my life. And also um, Dr. Shao is someone who makes things very easy to understand once again. Dr. Shao is a general internist and the medical director of the Leaf Medical or Weight Management Clinic, pardon me, a community-based multidisciplinary academic bariatric clinic in Ottawa, Ontario. Um, she is an associate pro professor in the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism at the University of Ottawa. She's also a program director for Bariatric Medicine Fellowship Program, and that is a huge win and why she is here today is a big part of why she's here today, rather. Um, because in that role, she really is training the next generation of physicians on how to best help patients uh, with living with their life, with obesity, living in larger bodies, all of the things that really we want the next generation of doctors to know are embodied in Dr. Shao. So I'm so excited that she's here to join us today. Let's welcome her to the stage and have her uh, share her information with us today. Hi, so good to see your face. Thank, Thank you, you for so coming. Much, <laughs> Amazing. All right, with that, I'll pass the stage to you and you can take everybody through what we have to share today. That's great. So. Um... Thank you so much all for joining me on this talk. Uh, I have a number of slides to go through, so we'll be going through them right now. Perfect. So this is the title, The Long-Term Management of Post-Bariatric Surgery. Next slide. I don't have any disclosures related to this talk um, uh, because I'm actually not a surgeon. And uh, perhaps that might surprise you that I'm involved in this discussion about post-surgical management. The fact is that when someone does go through surgery, definitely the surgeon is involved uh, with the surgery and you might have some visits with the surgeon um, a few months or weeks after the surgery. But in general, this talk, knowing that in the audience, there's a varied population. Um, there are people who are seeking maybe just a bit more information about bariatric surgery, or who have relatives or loved ones who have had bariatric surgery. And so I really want to just come up with some basic um, ideas of what is bariatric surgery. And I also know there is a number of clinicians out there. So I was trying to make sure that this talk would kind of hit um, highlights for everybody. Uh, so I'll be going very briefly about what type of surgeries exist, uh, what are the expectations you can have from bariatric surgery, and then recognizing what the lifestyle post-operatively can be and the importance of vitamin consistency, along with a discussion about potential complications and considerations. Next slide, please. On this slide, I have uh, images of four different types of surgeries. And just as a quick review, the first two rectangles, the first two pictures are what we call more restrictive surgeries, meaning you're just making your stomach size smaller. There's a big X over the one that says gastric band. The gastric band surgery is actually not really done anymore and in fact um, isn't viewed well because there's a number of complications. So essentially you see a ring that's put around the stomach and you see this tube that goes towards a port and saline is pushed through the port to um, inflate the ring so that it constricts the stomach. Uh, and so you might think, wow, that doesn't sound too bad, maybe. <laughs> but there was a number of complications, including erosions, et cetera. So in general, the band is not something that we're going to be talking about. There may be people in the audience who've had the band and they've had great experience with it, which is great. But there's also been a number of people who haven't. The sleeve surgery is uh, very popular in that, you know, it, there's an appeal in it because there seems to be less cuts. So you have a smaller stomach, essentially. You're, a large portion of the stomach is cut away and you're left with that sleeve of the stomach. The next two surgeries involve an element of malabsorption. So it's the gastric bypass and there's the duodenal switch. 
So both of them involve having two anastomoses. One, you have a smaller stomach and you anastomose a track of the intestine to the stomach. And then there's another anastomosis where it's intestine to intestine. And where the intestine to intestine meet is called the common channel. And that's where food, macronutrients will be absorbed. So the shorter the common channel, the less absorption, and then the potential for more complications. So the gastric bypass and duodenal switch both involve an element of malabsorption. You may have heard also single anastomosis surgeries. This has gained some popularity. I'm not really going to be talking about that because we really don't have the long-term data on that. So this talk is focused on the surgeries where we have some long-term data because this is a talk about the long-term complications and what we have to do post-bariatric surgery. Next slide, please. I'm gonna do one basic thing, which is what is a BMI? Now, I'm doing this because BMI is used as part of our criteria for treatment options for weight management. I do want to emphasize that the BMI is definitely some, not something that we do as a target goal. So if anyone has been told that they need to be whatever weight because of their height to be a BMI of 25, there's nothing about that in the literature that shows that this is something that has to be done from a health perspective. BMI is simply a calculation of how big a person is. So it is the kilograms of weight over the height in meter squares. And there's different ways to calculate it. You can just do it on your calculator or you can find an app or you can look online. And I like the NIH government one because it allows you to put kilograms or pounds or inches, et cetera. And you get a quick calculation of what your potential BMI is. Next slide, please. So the criteria for bariatric surgery currently is based on BMI. And the ones that are pretty much followed by most bariatric clinics across Canada is if you have a BMI that's calculated of 40 and above, um, whether you have obesity-related complications such as diabetes or hypertension or anything like that, as long as your BMI is greater than 40, you are a potential candidate for bariatric surgery. If your BMI is between 35 and 40, you must have one of those comorbidities like diabetes or sleep apnea. And newer lately was that if you were a BMI, are of a BMI between 30 to 34.9 and you have something such as uncontrolled diabetes, then you should also be considered for bariatric surgery. What has been going on uh, very recently internationally is that the shift in the BMI criteria have occurred such that if BMI of 35 without the presence of, of a comorbidity, they would say now you're indicated for bariatric surgery, uh, which is wonderful because that actually does open up the potential for having bariatric surgery to people who may not have qualified before. Um, that Guide change and guideline hasn't quite happened yet in Canada, and part of it has to do with resources. We already know that bariatric surgery is something difficult to obtain across Canada. And so how do we, if we suddenly have more people that would qualify, be able to uh, fulfill that? So it's, it's a tough question, but it is something that's coming up. Next slide, please. There are contraindications to bariatric surgery, and mainly this has to do with safety for an individual. It is an elective procedure. So if somebody has um, a substance abuse history that is not controlled, um, then that is something to have to think about very carefully. If uh, someone has a psychiatric condition that is not stable for at least six months, a diagnosis of cancer and a life expectancy of less than five years, um, it is highly recommended to not be a smoker for bariatric surgery because there are complications that can occur from the smoking, including ulcerations. And if you are someone who needs chronic NSAIDs, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, then especially for those that have um, uh, anastomoses like a Rouen wire duodenal switch, um, then we would ask that you not proceed with that type of surgery. Maybe it'd be better to have a sleeve surgery. Next slide, please. So what are the outcomes with bariatric surgery? Bariatric surgery still remains one of our most potent um, potential tool or treatment option uh, to have the most percent weight loss. Uh, the percent weight loss will vary depending on the type of surgery. So here you see the sleeve versus the Rouen Y versus the duodenal switch. 
and the sleeve again being that mainly restrictive procedure and the Roux and Y having that malabsorptive component. And with the malabsorptive component, you actually see that there's more percent weight loss. So the percent weight loss can be on average 25% for a sleeve, 30% weight loss with a rule Y, and 40% with a duodenal switch. But let's talk about beyond the scale, right? because I know many people want to lose weight, but ultimately it goes beyond that. And we really try to focus on those non-scale wins. The non-scale wins of, for instance, reduction of some comorbidities like resolution or remission of diabetes, hypertension, and sleep apnea. And you can see that that increases with each one of those surgeries as the percent weight loss also increases. Next slide, please. So what I want to bring into this conversation, however, is what are the expectations in terms of weight loss with these bariatric surgeries? And I want to bring in the conversation about our wording of percent weight loss or percent total weight loss versus percent excess body weight loss. Because sometimes if a person is looking at the literature or to hear quotations from sites about how much weight they're going to lose, it can get a bit confusing the language that's used. Now, most people nowadays and even in publications will focus on the term percent weight loss, your percent total weight loss. How much weight did you lose from your start weight versus percent excess body weight loss? So I'm going to give you an example. Say I'm five foot five inches and my initial weight is 300 pounds. My calculated BMI is 49.9. So if I lost 100 pounds from a bariatric surgery, and that is actually a good result to lose 100 pounds from 300 pounds, then my percent total weight loss or my percent weight loss is 100 over 300 times 100 equals about 33.3%. So I've lost a third of myself. That is percent weight loss or percent total weight loss. But you will see in the literature, and sometimes sites might quote to you, percent excess body weight loss. What does that mean? Excess body weight loss is actually comparing your current weight to what your weight could be at a BMI of 25. So that, and I'm putting my hands up here in quotations, all right, where people will say, oh, is the ideal weight or the normal weight, which again, I'm gonna emphasize has no value to you as an individual that are trying to manage weight, but it is used. And so if I'm at five foot five to calculate a BMI of 25, my weight would have to be 150 pounds. That means if I've lost 100 pounds from the surgery and to get to a BMI of 25, I should have lost 150 pounds then 100 over 150 pounds is 66.7%. So my percent excess body weight loss is 66.7%. And I'm saying this because sometimes people will tell you your percent excess body weight loss with the surgery will be 66.7% and you hear, wow, I'm 300 pounds, I'm going to lose 200 pounds. And I get 200 pounds, but that doesn't happen. None of the bariatric surgeries can quote you a 66% total weight loss. So I'm saying this because it gets confusing and that can impact your expectations for what can occur with bariatric surgery. Next slide, please. Here is a trajectory of how weight can change over the years. So this one goes in the x-axis, you see going up to five years. And you see in the yellow dotted line, people who have gone to the LAP band, the AGB adjustable gastric band. In the black line, you, you see people who went through the sleeve gastrectomy. And in the blue line, you see people who went through the gastric bypass. And you can see that the weight trajectory goes down up to year one. And then starting at year one, you see a bit of flattening of the curve. And then you start seeing the weight increase over time. And I'm going to tell you right now that this is normal. Okay? It is really normal to gain weight over time, irrespective of whatever treatment option or how just life is in general. It is normal for an individual to gain one to two pounds a year. And this happens even with people who have had bariatric surgery. And so the curve goes down and the curve goes up is a normal thing to expect. 
you can see here that the lines are essentially the average of whatever um, number of people who went through that surgical procedure. So that's the average weight loss. Now, I want to go to the next slide. And the next slide shows that no one intervention, not even bariatric surgery, will give you the same results. So you'll hear percent weight loss from anything, whether it's a medical program or a medication or bariatric surgery. And so with this one, which was concentrated on gastric bypass, and this is a large consortium um, called the Lab Studies through the U.S., and they looked at the trajectory of weight changes that occurred with gastric bypass, and they divided it into six groups of populations of trajectories. And so you say, okay, here's everybody that started at point zero, and how much weight did they lose? So the x-axis is the years of follow-up. And everybody at the six months mark was losing weight. And then it diverges. So some individuals actually started gaining weight almost immediately. And that would be the dark blue line, group one, a small percentage, 4.8%, but it happens. And then you have other individuals who lost weight and kept on losing up to two years. And you can see that in the green group, group six. And then you have a mix match of different people going through these trajectories. Next slide, please. So why does this happen? You know, that's the frustrating thing. And it boils down to the fact that we can't control the scale, can we? We can only recognize that we get these treatment options, these tools, and we'll see what happens. But a huge component of why there is such a variability in terms of response to weight is genetics. And this is a very nice study that was looking at 848 people who had gastric bypass and they were genotyped. And they were followed along after they had their surgery and they were analyzed in pairs. So in the first column is the first is 13 pairs of patients who were related by first degree. So um, uh, a father, child or siblings. So first degree relatives. The next column are completely random, uh, random pairs. And then the third column are pairs that were cohabitating, but not genetically related. So husband, wife, for instance. And you see here that with the first degree relatives, the change, the difference in weight loss was less as compared to those who were not genetically related or even living in the same environment. So it shows how genetics can play a huge role in terms of how we respond to any type of intervention. In this case, it is bariatric surgery. So let's say you are in the process of considering bariatric surgery and you have a first degree relative who has had surgery and you can kind of say, well, what was their experience? Because maybe that might uh, represent what your own experience will be. It's not 100% that way. There are multiple reasons how people might respond to surgery or not, but it is something to consider if that person lost a lot or didn't lose a lot, like that could be reflective of your own situation. Next slide, please. This is uh, one of the actually most strongest uh, trajectory of weight that I've seen, uh, which involves a dual nodal switch. And basically is the only one that I've seen where this line stays flat, even decades later. Uh, this is from the Quebec group. And they follow their patients really, really long-term. And I'm gonna emphasize that follow-up and long-term support is so important. Um, and as some of you may have experienced, if you go through a bari bariatric surgical site, they don't necessarily follow you forever. So then you turn toward your primary care provider. Um, or you turn to other bariatric specialists for that support, or you turn toward a counselor or a dietitian. So it's important to always access that support. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the complications of bariatric surgeries. And I don't wanna scare people, but I think <laughs> it's, it's more to know what can exist. A lot of people do super, I'm gonna caveat all of this by saying, People can do really, really well with bariatric surgery, but it's nice to know what are the potential complications. And of course, the worst complication is dying from an elective procedure. And that mortality rate is super low. 
It is quoted in the literature as less than one in a thousand. Serious adverse events, SAE, such as bleeding or um, infections, etc., you know, that's in that kind of three to five percent range. Um, and then, you know, I think more more concerning for people maybe too is just the long term potential um, impact of bariatric surgery. And definitely when you start having in the last two columns, like the Rouen Y and the duodenal switch, a malabsorption component, you know, the risk of um, uh, GI side effects, uh, particularly with duodenal switch to increase bowel movements, bloating, flatulence, et cetera, you know, that exists because it's a very malabsorptive type surgery. And then the risk of malnutrition by not um, being consistent with nutrition or taking your vitamins, that exists too it's with any of the surgeries, but, but more so with the malabsorptive ones. The sleeve surgery, you know, a lot of people start thinking, oh, maybe, you know, that sounds more attractive, right? There's no malabsorptive component. Yes, I need to take my vitamins, etc. But it too has its issues, including reflux, gastroesophageal reflux. Um, and it has been shown now that there's an increase of Barrett's esophagitis, which is something that can be precancerous. And I'm trying to scare people who have had sleep, but it has been shown that there's been an increased prevalence of this post sleep. And it is now recommended by consensus to have uh, endoscopy, an upper GI endoscopy, about every five years. Uh, that uh, amount of uh, needing to track the upper GI endoscopies every five years might change with time, but that's where we're currently at in terms of our um, suggestions for follow. Next slide, please. This slide, please don't get overwhelmed, uh, and I know this is being videoed. This is predominantly for the clinicians in the, um, in the audience, but also I think helpful for patients who um, have had bariatric surgery and are experiencing pain in your abdomen. And so most commonly for pain post bariatric surgery uh, in the abdomen would likely be gallstones. And that would typically present with right upper quadrant pain, uh, post prandial, meaning after eating and resolves when you've had the uh, gallbladder taken out. So that would be the end of that one. Uh, the other one would be ulcerations. So this is why stopping smoking is extremely important and not having the anti-inflammatories, particularly with the malabsorptive procedures. And that can be managed with some medications. Uh, strictures are when food gets stuck, and so that can be resolved with an endoscopic dilatation. But I do want to bring up the topic of internal hernias, which we can see with the um, surgeries that involve an anastomosis. And this is something that can occur even years after surgery. So a hernia, many of you know what a hernia is, and you know you hear of that uh, hernia that pops out from your abdomen, but this is one that you don't see, it's deep inside. And it goes through the mesentery and essentially can present as pain in the abdomen that occurs after eating. And a typical pattern may be that someone was at a stable weight for a while, but now because they're getting the pain when they eat, they, they, they don't eat that food and they, lose, and they lose more weight. So this is something to report to your um, bariatric team or to your primary care practitioner because it does need to be investigated. Next slide, please. So let's talk about weight regain. I already said to you that there is normalcy in regaining weight after surgery. Different surgeries have different proportion of weight regain. There is stats out there that show that some people can regain all their weight back after bariatric surgery. Obviously, this is not great for the individual, um, but it does happen, which just shows how difficult weight management is and that we're still struggling to find the right tool. It's not necessarily the patient's fault that they've regained weight. It's just that we haven't found the right tool yet for them. And we see the rate of weight regain occur um, more so if you're only in the restrictive types of surgeries and less so when you have a component of the malabsorption. Next slide, please. But when is it that we get concerned? Okay? And so let's think about those non-scale wins. We get concerned 
And I call this pathological weight regain for the clinicians. Like weight regain, again, I emphasize there's a normalcy in that. But when do we really get worried is if there's reoccurrence of those comorbidities. And it doesn't necessarily have to just be diabetes or sleep apnea, et cetera. It could be, it could be other things like bone, like um, knee pain, et cetera, et cetera. And a reoccurrence of 20% of the total weight loss uh, typically starts to see a return of those comorbidities. Next slide. So it boils down then to remembering some of the principles that you would have received training in uh, when you went for your bariatric surgical assessment. And it is so easy to drift away from things that we learn. It's so normal for us to kind of fall back into old habits. And we've had just a great conversation just before the break with Dr. Vallis on this. So with bariatric surgery, it's important to have you know, regularity in meals. So three to five small meals a day, you need to chew your food thoroughly. And it's important to separate your liquids from your solids. There has to be at least a delay of 30 minutes. And people forget that. And the reason to do that is because if you take the liquids and the solids at the same time, you can wash the food through quicker. It's important also to have good quality protein. You know, sometimes people say that they're feeling hungry again after bariatric surgery. But if the nutritional, the macronutrient components of what you're eating isn't the best, then of course you're going to be hungrier. So that 60 grams of protein minimally for any of the bariatric surgeries is important. And you're trying to avoid the concentrated sweets um, to minimize what we call dumping and also to reduce the caloric intake. Next slide, please. So what is dumping? Okay, this happens after what we usually after gastric bypass surgery, you can hear about these things. And um, it relates to the quality of food. So, so certainly, let's say you take something that has um, simple carbohydrates, uh, then, you know, there's could be abdominal discomfort. You can have that kind of gurgling, nausea, diarrhea, and then there's an influx of fluids into the gut and suddenly you become hypotensive. You feel unwell and you need to lie down and that can happen within first hour after a meal. But what can also happen is a couple of hours after the meal, you have this reflex of insulin in your body trying to respond to that sugar and you actually have low sugar levels. And so then you get caught in a cycle because your sugar levels go low, you reach for the simple carbs again, and then your sugars go low. And so what we're trying to do is prevent dumping syndrome from happening. Next slide, please. And it boils down to usually just getting back into that habit of good structured meals, the protein, the good quality snacks. Um, for the clinicians out there, if someone is reporting fasting hypoglycemia, then it's important to rule out more um, other entities for the low sugars, including an insulinoma. So just to keep that in mind. Um, from a dietary change, you know, I've read in the literature where some people will add cornstarch, like a slurry of cornstarch corn starch at the end of the day, which just to me sounds so unappealing. So most of the times, if you can just stick to the regularity of meal, complex carbohydrates, that dumping syndrome is mitigated. Going to the next level would mean medications, and I've listed a few there for the clinicians. Next slide. Vitamins. I can't emphasize that enough. It is important that people continue to take their vitamins with any of the surgeries, whether you are restrictive or malabsorptive surgeries. Uh, next slide. Why? Because you're bypassing a tract of your intestine. And this is just an example from the gastric bypass. So you see this tract of stomach and intestine and an orange, the section you're skipping over. And you can see from the lines, all the minerals and the vitamins that are usually absorbed. And so if you're skipping over that, then you need some means of replacing it. Next slide. And so we know whether it's the sleeve or rural Y or the duodenal switch, and you can see here different uh, minerals and vitamins and the prevalence that we have seen reported one year after surgery of the amount of uh, deficiencies that it can occur. And with the duodenal switch, we see much more compared to the ruin Y as compared to the sleeve. Next slide. So a word on that is that if you're able to take your vitamins, okay, 
consistently, you can actually prevent a lot of the bad things from happening. And one of the things that is important is the role of calcium and vitamin D. So with respect to calcium, we see that if you take your calcium and vitamin D, you can do a lot in terms of prevention of things like osteoporosis. Um, now, here's something that some people don't quite realize is that after the bariatric surgeries, particularly, particularly the ones that have a malabsorption component, there is a higher risk of kidney stones, calcium oxalate kidney stones to be exact. And this has to do with the fat malabsorption in the gut, right, which interrupts oxalate, which is typically bound within the gut, and that oxalate is reabsorbed and then flushed through the kidneys. So that puts you at a higher risk for calcium oxalate stones. So for some reason, it's almost like anybody, whether you're a clinician or a patient, when they hear that they have kidney stones, they basically think, well, I should stop taking my calcium. But that's actually the opposite. You need, you need to continue your calcium. And typically, it's recommended that you take calcium citrate um, post-bariatric surgery. And that calcium citrate actually helps bind the oxalate too, so that you, you, you keep it within the gut. And that reduces the risk of recurrence of kidney stones. Next slide. So prevention is often easier than treatment. Next slide. Which means taking your vitamins. Okay? And again, people drift from this. They, they drift, they forget, and it's so normal. And I'm not trying to lecture or blame or shame, but certainly if you know a loved one who's had bariatric surgery and they don't seem to be taking their vitamins, a gentle little nudge in this partnership uh, would be a good thing. Okay? Now, the vitamin issue can be a bit complicated, um, but hopefully wherever a person goes for bariatric surgery, they've been given a list, you know, they've been given suggestions and the important thing is to follow through on it. So if you're just looking for what you can buy over the counter, it typically means taking two general multivitamins, uh, adding on a B supplement, adding on the calcium citrate and vitamin D, and then adding on the iron. And the iron and the calcium cannot be taken at the same time because the calcium will actually prevent the absorption of the iron. Next slide. There are specialty bariatric vitamin formulations, and there are chewable versions, and there's non and then there's um, non chewable versions. Um, I do want to emphasize to read the labels carefully. For instance, the first one here actually says two and one chewable, and so sometimes people think I only need to take one of those just from the label, but in reality, you still need to take four. Next slide. And so again, there's some other supplements that are capsule format. Uh, even the ones that might say that they're only one a day, you still have to be careful because that may not contain either the calcium or the iron. So you still need to take supplements on top of that. So when in doubt, it would be great to either go back to your bariatric site to find out or you know, talk to a dietitian. You know, and I can't emphasize um, the importance of having a dietitian post bariatric surgery follow along and guide you through this. Next slide, please. Blood work, right? from a clinician and a patient perspective, typically we would ask people to do blood work yearly okay, after bariatric surgery. So I got to say, the evidence behind that is not the best. Um, there's probably a time in your life, if your blood work is consistently doing well yearly, you don't necessarily have to do it yearly. Maybe you could skip a year one year, as long as you're taking your vitamins and supplements correctly. I, feel I, I think that's a fair thing to do. But as you know, you know, if you don't make the appointment to see your primary care provider, then that blood work may not happen. So it's really important that you be your own advocate for self-monitoring. Um, because you can't order your own blood work as a patient. Next slide, please. Pregnancy. Pregnancy post-bariatric surgery. All right. It is recommended to wait 18 months post-bariatric surgery minimum. Essentially, what you're waiting for is to be at that lower weight but stable, because usually you hit your nadir weight, your slower weight, somewhere at that one year to 18 months mark. 
It is recommended that you take folic acid pre-pregnancy, one milligram, all the way through to the end of breastfeeding. How much weight is recommended to gain during pregnancy is no different than an individual who hasn't had bariatric surgery. And the recommended total weight gain is based from the Institute of Medicine. And for instance, let's say your pre-pregnancy BMI was 30 or above, then the recommended weight gain during that pregnancy would be 11 to 20 pounds or five to nine kilos. Next slide. Again, emphasis on work with a dietitian. That would be lovely if you could do that when pregnant uh, because they can guide you through that, guide to you what the protein needs are, the calorie needs are. And also, I think there may be that psychological barrier to weight gain during pregnancy that can occur for some individuals. So that's an important thing to consider also. Next slide. These are um, other aspects with respect to pregnancy. Vitamin A, it's important to switch to a beta carotene and not a retinal version. So this would mean switching over to one of the um, uh, formulations of multivitamins that are meant for pregnancy. If someone is really sick, like you know having uh, a lot of nausea and vomiting, then it's important to add on extra thiamine. If you're thiamine deficient, you can actually have neurological damage. So it's important to make sure that you have enough thiamine. Blood work becomes every trimester. And um, as many of the women in the audience have probably experienced when you're pregnant, you will be doing one of those sugar tests where they make you drink that sugar to check for your, to, to see if you're having any issues with respect to glucose. But we don't recommend that with people who have had bariatric surgery because if you did, you risk having a dumping syndrome. And if you did that, you'd feel really, really awful. So we avoid doing that if anything, Post-bariatric surgery, it may mean doing a few finger pricks uh, to check your glucose levels, and then and that would be the way to monitor. Next slide. Okay. A word on mental health. Okay. Um, so for sure, there's a lot of positive with bariatric surgery, but I think we need to be very conscientious that this surgery does not fix everything. As there's nothing that will fix everything, whether it's medications or, or programs. So a check-in about mental health is extremely important because we do know that mental health can worsen after uh, weight loss with bariatric surgery. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, it could be um, that increased attention. Um, there could be relationship changes now. There may be pressures to overcome certain social or economic difficulties. I'm going to talk just briefly about binge eating because I think this is an important thing to, to recognize in, in bariatric medicine in general. There can be replacement of addictive behaviors. I mean, suddenly that relationship with food is changed with bariatric surgery, and we recognize that. And what are alternate ways of managing stress, depression, anxiety? That's not necessarily food related. And then there is this higher kind of prevalence of suicidality that's been noted post-bariatric surgery, uh, more so than in the general population. And we don't quite know why, but it is there. And so this is important to check in again with yourself, but also check in with your loved ones or a friend or a colleague uh, who may have disclosed that they've had bariatric surgery. Next slide, please. A word about binge eating disorder. So this is actually the most prevalent eating disorder in the adult population, more so than anorexia or bulimia. So what is binge eating disorder? Typically it's described as having a large amount of food in a discrete amount of time. So, you know, it could be almost 2000 calories in a couple of hours. And it's accompanied with um, uh, this uncomfortable feeling that you're doing, you, you might still eat even though you're uncomfortable, even though you're not hungry, you might eat alone, you feel really guilty and depressed afterwards, and it's occurring maybe even once a week or more. Okay? So that, that, that's what a binge eating disorder can look like. Now, next slide, please. The prevalence in the general population is about 2.8%, so just under 3% for binge eating disorder. But the prevalence for people who are living in a bigger body with obesity and seeking bariatric surgery is reported much higher. It could be up to 20, 25% of patients, depending on the literature. 
So if you are looking for support in bariatric surgery, it's important to disclose if you are or if you think you have binge eating disorder because the bariatric surgery will not fix that. You still need additional support, that cognitive therapy. Perhaps there may be a medication that will have to be considered. Um, because even after bariatric surgery, people can still binge. You might say, but I have a smaller stomach now. But people won't have necessarily that classic presentation of binging. But what they could do is graze. Right? Or they could melt that tub of ice cream and drink the ice cream. Or they could drink and eat at the same time and have considerable amount of food flush through your system. So uh, what I'm just saying is that if you think that you or your loved one has binge eating disorder and is seeking bariatric surgery, it's so important to disclose that. Next, or, uh, next slide. And then alcohol use disorder. Okay? This too, we see a higher prevalence of occurring after surgery because essentially, for example, after gastric bypass, you're absorbing it much more efficiently. So two alcoholic beverages can suddenly be equivalent to four. So another thing to be very cognizant of that can happen post-surgery. Next slide. Okay. So this is pretty much where I'm ending on, but I didn't want to end on a low note. <laughs> I did want to end on a high note because I think I, con I maybe concentrated a bit more on complications or considerations. Um, overall, actually, many people have very good positive experiences with bariatric surgery. It's just that maybe when they come to a specialist or a, in a bariatric clinic, we tend to see the people who are having more complications and, and so on. We don't see the people who are necessarily just doing great. You know, and that's terrific. You found the tool that's working for you. So again, emphasizing that bariatric surgical outcomes, we see uh, the highest percent weight loss, more so than uh, medications. Um, and we also see the highest resolution of those comorbidities. It's just amazing. and the happiness and joy I see for patients who've had successful surgery and no longer need to use their CPAP, for instance. So these are the beauties that can occur with bariatric surgery. Next slide. There you go. This is the last slide. So I tried to give a whirlwind tour in less than 45 minutes about bariatric surgery. That last slide was really looking at um, the chapter that I wrote for post-surgical management in the obesity guidelines. And uh, you can download it. It's got some tables there. It's got some practical information. Uh, a lot of what I just said in this talk. Well, thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you so much. You did a fantastic whirlwind job of taking us through that as um, somebody who has navigated this kind of space and was introduced to a medical program that was part of my surgical experience. Um, I will also say I was a person that maybe was more on that line that started gaining weight sooner um, and after my surgery. And to know that there are physicians like out there that still hold space for people who might feel like that extra layer of shame or a failure after surgery is so, so important. So I appreciate the work you do. I think you did a fantastic job of outlying the different types of surgery options and what this really looks like post-operatively as well. So thank you so much for your time. There were a couple of questions, but we are at time for the session today. So we'll hold on to those and we'll make sure to try and address them through the sessions today or in follow-up in our connected community. So thank you so much, Dr. Zhao.